Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Josh Human, Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Power Plant. Before beginning, Toronto is located on the traditional territory of several nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional owners of this territory and their unique role in the life of the region. The power plant is committed to honoring Indigenous peoples' unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land and waters and their rich contribution to society. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And we ask that you respect the land and traditions of those who walked upon the land for millennia before us. Now I read those words and I know there's been uh, quite a bit of discourse about what land acknowledgements mean. And I'm hoping that tonight's program actually puts some of that spirit of the land acknowledgement um, into action. Um, so this evening's program is a town hall titled Indigenous Art Spaces, a Self-Determined Way Forward. So a little bit of history. The Toronto Arts Council's open door funding stream seeks proposals that might inspire sectoral change. In 2018, the power plant reached out to other Toronto area non-collecting contemporary art and film nonprofits, including the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Centre, Gallery 44 Centre for Contemporary Photography, Le Labo, Sur Gallery, Tangled Art Plus Disability, Whippersnapper Gallery, XSpace, and YYZ Artists Outlet. Together, we received a grant for a two-year initiative, what we're calling the Horizon Initiative, to figure out how we can better serve artists in the greater Toronto area in the very near future. So tonight's program would not have been possible without the generous support of the Toronto Arts Council. Uh, also a shout out to Adept Word Management. Uh, they are based in the United States. Uh, they are a transcription service and they have been transcribing for this entire initiative all the different focus groups and town halls. So thank you to them as well. So really some of the questions this initiative is looking at, are looking at, is uh, how can Toronto's non-collecting contemporary art and film nonprofits play our part to ensure a healthy and vibrant artist's community? What do artists need that we might reasonably work toward providing? And what are challenges that artists face that we might reasonably help them to overcome? All the while, of course, we have to consider our staff members who are typically maxed out. We have limited resources and exhibition opportunities. There is no mechanism for these non-collecting organizations to purchase artworks from artists. And we're not large enough, even as a collective, to affect systemic changes, like lowering real estate values so as to lower the cost of housing and workspaces, which has become evident through this past year uh, to be really the number one uh, concern of most artists with whom we've spoken. So during year one of the Horizon Initiative, from December 1st of 2018, through November 30th of this year, 2019, these nine partner organizations have coordinated 11 focus groups and three town hall programs. We've gathered data about what artists need and want. And so looking forward uh, to year two of the Horizon Initiative, which will start December 1st of this year, 2019, through November 30th of 2020, we will develop and offer programs that address those needs and wants of artists. So please stay tuned uh, for more from all of the partner organizations. So even though this is the last official activity of year one of this Horizon Initiative, it was actually top of my list uh, when this grant was given. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I hope, I feel like I hope that we are putting into action the words uh, so often read out as land acknowledgements. I knew that I was not the right person to organize a town hall about self-determination and indigenous art spaces. 
Uh, so as a result, very early on in this process, many months ago, I reached out to Métis artist and activist Clayton Windat. Uh, and I'm truly grateful for his leadership and vision uh, in extending an invitation to J.P. Longboat uh, to bring him into this dialogue. Now Longboat, uh, together with Terry Lynn Brennan, uh, Alex Glass uh, at Arts Build Ontario, uh, Clayton is on an advisory uh, committee, um, have been working on, on sort of precisely this topic. Uh, so Longboat is a storyteller, performer, and established multidisciplinary artist of the Mohawk Turtle Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River. Uh, regrettably, uh, Dr. Terry Lynn Brennan was unable to join us this evening, uh, but we do have uh, Alex Glass, uh, Interim Executive Director at Arts Build Ontario, uh, here as well. Uh, so last, before I turn over the microphone, um, I do want to share with everyone what the power plant um, like other organizations uh, in this Horizon initiative, but what the power plant is already offering to artists by way of support. Um, so in addition to public programs like Artist Talks and In Conversations, uh, what I sort of regard as continuing education for artists, uh, we currently offer a half-price annual membership for artists at just $30 per year. Uh, that membership uh, includes uh, the ability to participate in master class programs, which are like crit sessions facilitated by some of our exhibiting artists, and portfolio nights, which are like speed dating with curators and established artists. And of course, each season, we organize additional member-only programs, which include artist members as well. Um, so if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to ask me after this program. Uh, but for now, I'd like to invite to the stage Peter Scott, who has been working uh, as our project consultant uh, for year one uh, of the Horizon Initiative. Uh, please welcome Peter. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many people in the, uh, here tonight. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Peter Scott, as Josh mentioned, and I'm the project manager uh, for this project. Um, my role is more at the, the back end in terms of, um, as we do these town halls and focus groups, uh, my, key, my main role is, is collecting the data, and, uh, and so I've been, been busy uh, collecting qualitative data, quantitative data, and basically, um, just put in that, seeing how the data falls. A lot of these, the work that you do when you're working with data is just observing what what's, what the data is saying. And and so, so I've been I've been busy collecting the data and working with Josh and working with all of the various partners that we that Josh mentioned. And and basically, uh, been been uh, in, in create frameworks so that we can kind of absorb the data, look at it, and 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 make sense of it. And um, and I, I really enjoy doing that. My background is in design, design thinking, systems thinking. So that's, that's something that I, I relish with. Um, at the end of collecting all of these data, uh, you know, a, a, a report will be uh, generated internally. This report will get, get used by all the partners. They'll use that and respond to the information that they're seeing. And as Josh mentioned, year two, they will, there will be a series of other projects that, that, that they will be responding uh, uh, to. Um, so, so one of the things I want to bring your attention to, I, I don't know if you've seen it flash a couple of times, is a QR code. And so one of the main reasons why I'm here is to encourage you to please do the survey. That's my main point here. I would really, really appreciate it if you could make sure you do the survey. The way to access the survey is, 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 uh, is through our QR codes. And, and you'll see it flash a couple of times, but at the end of the night, at the end of the day, you'll see, you'll see it flash at the end and it'll, and it'll stay up. So if you have a chance to zap on it. If you don't, if you don't have an electronic device, just come and see me. And, and you can also access it here as well. I'll give you a copy and you can, if you don't have an electronic device, come and see me and I'll give you a paper copy. But my preference, would be is that you, uh, you, you check the QR code and go right into the survey and do the survey and, and help us spread the word to actually get the survey out. out. So without further ado, I want to just invite uh, JP Longboat up now to the stage. 
and, um, and he will kick off the rest of the evening. But for now, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. All right. It's hard to see them. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You're there. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, very, very honored to be here. Um, uh, this is actually my traditional territory uh, around, around the Great Lakes and then south uh, under and along the waterways uh, up to St. Lawrence is, is my traditional territory as a, uh, as a Haudenosaunee uh, Turtle Clan uh, uh, Mohawk man. So that's, uh, that's where I'm from. Um, there's so much to, there's so much to, to, to share. So, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll move into the things that I want to touch on and hopefully through the evening we'll weave to get together some of these threads that are and these conversations and activities that are going on right now in the sector and, uh, and hopefully be able to uh, give you a clear picture of where we are right now. Um, often our art, <laughs> we don't have a word for art in our language, but often our art tells the history and the, and the, and the cultural legacy of our peoples in our territory. Uh, that's what I've come to know about uh, through my own artistic practice. Uh, so, there's, so this evening there's so much to cover, we'll, and, and as I said, I mentioned, I, uh, we'll do our best to re uh, weave all the strands together. Uh, tonight, uh, I think I'll go with, into an, a, a few areas. I'll start with a little history, I'll talk about uh, my own artistic and cultural journey through the visual arts, the performing arts, and then into the, uh, into the uh, uh, arts of choreography and dance. Um, and although I'm, I'm trained as a visual artist, uh, I've taken this real journey through, through the performing arts, through storytelling, uh, and researching and reclaiming uh, my own narrative, my own cultural narrative, which happens on many different levels. Um, so performance, live performance, and ritual are, are my, my personal passions, and that's what I'm primarily, the, the, the areas that I'm primarily working in. I think my passion for live performance has also fueled my passion for action right now. And I think that's, to me, that's part of the message that I, that I want to carry with me, is that we've, we've spoken for a long time, we've consulted, we've talked, We've identified what we need. It's really time for action. So with the project that I'm doing with Arts Build Ontario, the initiative, it's really about action. Uh, so to take, to take some of this uh, very positive uh, movement in terms of reconciliation uh, and reclaiming and, and, con and continue to make that into action. Um, of course, tonight we're also going to support the, uh, the wisdom and the, uh, the knowledge that Clayton's going to bring in terms of the vis visual arts sector as well. Uh, so it's really nice to be here with him and, and we can uh, kind of uh, share both of those perspectives with you tonight. So I'm going to share a little bit of history. Um, I also served uh, at the Canada Council for the Arts for about eight years as a program officer in dance. And at that time, uh, when I came into the council in 2001, it was just a couple years that they began. In 1998, they actually began uh, the specific Indigenous peer committees and specifically uh, targeted Aboriginal funding for, uh, for different art projects. So we can talk about what's happened over the years in terms of some of the public funding. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about performance, creation, practice, and training. And then also what's happening currently in the sector in terms of initiatives around uh, Canadian heritage, uh, Indigenous uh, arts presenters, Capicoa and, and uh, Arts Build, on, uh, uh, Ontario Presents has also been working on uh, some areas around networking and that sort of thing. So those are the areas that I want to cover, but I'm going to, at this point, turn the floor over to Clayton. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, hi everybody, my name is Clayton Windat. Uh, I'm a mixed blood Métis uh, of the Mississaugas of New Credit, non-status, living and working up in Nipissing First Nations territory, which is, uh, for me, Sturgeon Falls. But I also love coming down here and visiting everybody, and I work in Toronto often. Um, I'll throw, oh, I'll do my slides really quick. How's everybody doing tonight? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. I just a little bit of love sometimes goes a long way. 
All right, so this is me in front of a monument in Ottawa. This is one of the monuments that bothers me less than most monuments because it's kind of awesome. Um, but it's also like when people that know me really well see this, that they start laughing because they know I absolutely hate monuments. Like I just, they make me nuts. Giant slabs of bronze make me cringe. Um, and, but this one's less cringy, so it's kind of awesome. It's about indigenous uh, vets that have fought in wars, so you know, it's hard to be like upset about people that care about lost loved ones. Uh, and then we think about this image uh, here, which is uh, a teepee on the shore of Lake Nipissing. This is on uh, Amatogzi's property. On Amatogzi, uh, which means he or she speaks in Anishinaabewin, which is uh, uh, Anishinaabe Ojibwe language. Um, this teepee uh, is, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Amatogzi instead of talking about my own arts practice. And part of that is this, this idea of um, self-determined organizations and the roles they play and sort of like their involvement within society. And, you know, if Sid and Penny ever see this, uh, I'm looking for notes on how you're going to critique me. Sid, Sid Bob and Penny Cucci are the uh, co-artistic directors of Amatogzi, and I've worked with them very much over the years. So this image is a starting point. Um, I think one of the reasons why uh, JP alluded to me bringing light from the visual arts con context is that I've uh, recently left my job as the executive director of the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective and I was involved there for, I don't know, almost 10 years but the last three and a half were as the executive director. And um, it was a beautiful, beautiful time in my life. I love everything they're doing. Camille Usher who replaced me is absolutely amazing. I'm super excited. I also want to say this past fall was the first time in the last 10 years that I haven't been at an annual general meeting of theirs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, uh, and I feel bad, but I also feel great because I was doing my own art practice in Montreal while it was happening. So I had really good reason to go and do something else. And it felt so good to do something for me. Um, anyway, that's literally the only reason why I wanted to have that up there is that the visual arts world has been a large part of my life and uh, the ACC has been a large part of that. But going back to this, uh, this, this, this object, this thing, mm. uh, the TP, and um, well, the reason why I'm fixating on it a little bit is that uh, Amatogzi has a massive amount of uh, cultural capacity as an organization. Um, knowledge, teachings, uh, engaging with community in various capacities, holding that space, and um, if it wasn't under an arts context, it would just be life. Like these are things that we do, these are the ways that we live. It isn't uh, special and unique until someone who doesn't understand it sees it. And the TP uh, as an object sort of takes that on. Um, this is an installation at the very early stages for uh, the uh, installation art festival Ice Follies. Uh, there's a promo of it. You can see us lighting it up in the background where there was a, a giant performance that took place in the middle of the frozen lake. Uh, I believe that was 2016. Uh, the reason why I'm showing this is that it's this idea of uh, bringing self into an environment and that that context of self changes as a result. And, um, you know, if Sid and Penny were here, they're like, no, it doesn't doesn't change. I'm like, no, but the point is that it's translating it. So like that notion of uh, bringing self into another place allows people to learn and understand from the other position. And the relationship that forms uh, becomes like a relationship that is, has a higher level of awareness. So in Canada, like we're, we're fixating so much lately on like our differences and our similarities. But in the end, it's really about like, where's the relationship going? Where is it now? Where has it been and where is it going to be next? And that's on an individual or, you know, nation level relationship. So it changes. Um, you know, Ice Follies had a glow, uh, light up teepee out on the lake and it drew people in. It was a focal point to a massive production that Amatoxi did for their Serpent People project, which I'm very privileged to have been able to participate in. I take no credit for any of these images at all. I think it's all them, although they would argue that I was involved and that's great and I love them, but in the end, there they are. They just got operating from the Canada Council for the first time. 
when they've been doing this work for 10 plus years on their own before that, the circle uh, of money, the circle of uh, what is and is not art is recontextualizing itself. People are more open to these relationships and therefore uh, people that uh, care about themselves and their communities are finding place within that, but the work is you know, never done. And here's some self, uh, shameless self-promotion. There's a piece I did as an installation in one of their things. There's an installation at uh, uh, Dances of Resistance by Jake Chikasim and Jules Kustachin that, uh, you know, and that's it. I'll just leave that up so that there's something on the screen other than me. <laughs> and that was, that was basically, put the TP back up. Put the TP back <laughs> yeah, that's up. so beautiful. So in the right context, I guess what I'd say is, uh, this is just there to be used for uh, the purposes of a TP without it being an art piece. But after it's gone out in the lake, everyone looks at it as an art piece. And it's hard for that context to change, but it's not that it's became an art piece. To us, it was always something amazing, but it's just more functional and employed and, and all that. So there's this constant idea of contextualizing self in relation to the other, and the other contextualizing self in relation to the other back. So, I mean, that's where we're at. And now uh, let's go into your awesome project. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll make sure to, if you're gonna talk, I'll pass this mic over. Oh, you got one? Okay. Well, that's an interesting segue because I think I'm very much uh, re recontextualizing myself to my own territory. So, uh, and that's been the pro my own process over the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, I'm from Six Nations, which is just west of Hamilton, just down the road here, okay? Um, but uh, that's not my traditional territory specifically. Uh, Chief, uh, Joseph Brandt brought us there after the Revolutionary War, after the Americans did their best to to burn and, and to, to uh, destroy our villages after the war as much as possible to, to push us out of the uh, United States um, as, as part of the history. So I'm recon I definitely very much recon recontextualizing myself in terms of, um, in terms of uh, my whole territory, uh, which is, which is from, from here all the way over to uh, almost the eastern seaboard in upstate New York. So, well, what, and, and what does that mean? Well, it means that I actually travel differently on the territory now. I'm much more focused on the waterways. Uh, I, I do live in Ottawa, right along the shores of the Gitchissippi uh, River, which is uh, just an incredible river that connects the, the St. Lawrence, Lawrence all the way across to Lake Nipissing, uh, uh, and really opened up uh, so much for Canada and the establishment of Canada uh, through trade and, and, and uh, resources and uh, and, and economy and, and from there on. Uh, so that's opening my eyes a great deal. Uh, just to, you know, as I, as I start to research and investigate, um, I came to understand the, the story of the eels in, uh, in, the, in the river there and how they actually uh, spawn in the, in the Atlantic and make that journey f uh, from the salt water into the fresh water and then all the way up into the river. We have an eel clan in, uh, in, in, in my way. We have an eel clan. And it made so much sense, you know, that's our relationship, that's our, that's our contextualization of who we are uh, at one point in time. You know, those, those were so important to us. We, those were, those were uh, something we depended on for sustenance and, uh, and uh, the re part of the resources of the river and the water. So um, there's just so many, so many layers to this in that f even if you look at the process of colonization, uh, it's very much cut us off from our traditional food sources, for example, uh, uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and that's just, a, that's just a basic truth. And the elders, I, and, and I, I do want to continue with, the, uh, s with situating this discussion um, in the process of truth and reconciliation. And my elders continually, at this point even now, are, are, are continuing to say, you know, we're still in the, we're still in the process of truth yet. <laughs> is to actually let, you know, uncover all of the truth, right? So we're still in that process of truth, and, and of course we're, we're turning the wheel and it's coming into reconciliation um, and reclaiming, and each of us have to define what that process is, is, is for our own selves, both, you know, both settlers and, and, and native people. I've, I've started my process of reconciliation, and that's a, re, that's a 
reforming of my relationship with the land and the territory here uh, as part of my, my base process of doing this. So when I started doing that, I realized, oh my God, we're, we're also separate from, from, the, from the places that, uh, that took care of us or, or, or sacred places or places where we, we really lived on the land. Uh, and what does that mean to maybe possibly re-inhabit those places? Um, uh, and I think that is very powerful, but that, that, and that also very much is tied into my own artistic practice. And I, I have to say that I'm, and I always say this, I'm so thankful for the training I was able to have and to receive. It was first through the Center for Indigenous Theater. Uh, in 1995, they reestablished the Center for, oh, well, it was, then it was called the Native Theater School, which transitioned into the Center for Indigenous Theater here in Toronto. Uh, but at that time, what they were talking about and what they introduced to us were a couple of very deep things. We were embarking on what our indigenous performance culture is. And that was just a simple question that, that brought us together. What is our indigenous performance culture? And we started to, to start to, uh, to, to relook at that. The other thing that they uh, really, really shared with us is that we have ancestral memory in our body. I think we, I think we feel the effects of residential school because that's the, that's the truth of it. We do pass those memories on. Uh, and that, for me, was very powerful if, you know, when, there, when I was hearing that, oh my God, I have ancestral memory. I can actually reconnect. I can actually re-remember. Uh, and so that took me, that really took me, that was really the piece that took me uh, along the performing arts practice uh, uh, journey because I wanted to investigate that. I wanted to find a way where I could remember. Uh, and it was through my body. It was through physical theater training but also into dance and choreography. So that was at the beginning of, uh, of, that, of that time for me as an artist uh, that set me on that trajectory. That took me to uh, places like the Banff Center for the Arts, for example, and then the Banff Center uh, uh, offered for a number of years an Aboriginal dance training program, which was a mix of uh, contemporary training with uh, the act of bringing together practitioners from across the country, uh, a diversity of indigenous uh, performers and cultural practitioners that would share their way. You know, uh, uh, people from the north, both, both in the eastern and western Arctic, west coast, uh, plains, eastern woodland. You know, all of those, all of those folks would come together uh, and we would share in incredible ways. I, I mean, that, that training was so incredible for me. Uh, because I got to get a sense of the country, to share with communities, uh, and then begin to travel and, and move into these territories and share with them and learn protocol. Um, I think I also, at, at this point, should also mention that with, that with that history, when we started to create our programs, often they were very much situated within um, Western institutions like the BAMF Center. Uh, today now, we've just opened our indigenous uh, uh, theater uh, department at the National Arts Center. So again, um, and, and it's, it's not that I want to be critical of that, but for example, in the, at the history of BAMF, we are sort of, and we were sort of at that point, uh, you know, reliant on, on what they were able to provide us and, and, you know, times change, but, uh, uh, boards change, you know, uh, mandates change, and eventually the, you know, the program was sort of, uh, sort of just shifted and made, made less than what, it, what I think it could have been. Um, so with those kinds of experiences going forward, um, that's part of what fueled my interest in the real commitment to say, okay, well, wait a second, we actually have to start creating our own now um, in a self-determined way. I mentioned in, that in 1998 at the Canada Council for, for the Arts, they brought in uh, specific indigenous programs, but at the same time, they had to listen to the feedback that artists were getting when they were coming to the council, and, and that on these committees, you might have, you know, you, if I was gonna write a grant in terms of a cultural, you know, a cultural arts practice uh, you know, that I work in, 
and we send it into a committee and the committee only has one indigenous person on it and you know, who knows what their practice is at, at this point, it, it wasn't proper in terms of how, in terms of the peer process. The people around that table were not peers of the artists that were coming to the competition. So there was a big shift, which was, which was, which was really wonderful. So the shift came in, officers came in, and we were able to start running programs specifically for indigenous, uh, indigenous artists, both, both project and then eventually annual funding. So I worked in, in the, in the uh, period of time where we created actually six indigenous performance dance companies that actually came into, came into being, came into existence. Uh, which was quite special. Um, and they've gone on uh, to, for, to me to make, you know, just to do incredible things. But also at the same time, they were taxed with developing their own dancers because there's no programs out there that are going to develop indigenous dancers specifically. So these kinds of things are what's happening with, with, within the sector. Um, that's continued on. The Canada Council has continued on to evolve, and now they have a section that's specifically uh, called Creating, Knowing, and Sharing, which will, which will allow us to work specifically in a, in a cultural context. And uh, uh, that, that, to me, is quite supportive, and it's doing well at this point. Performance creation practice and training. So I'm just mentioning a little bit of training. There aren't a lot of programs that are going to develop specifically indigenous training, uh, indigenous dancers choreographers, et cetera. So that often, that often falls on to the, uh, the current contemporary practitioners who are out there, and that's a real, that's a real burden. So, but in that also, how do we find uh, the type of space that's gonna support our, our, our practice? The work that, that I work in, the, the collective that I work in as a collective of artists, we want to work in a circular way. We come together and we collaboratively cl create the work we're making. That means there's no, there's no like a specific choreographer, there's no hierarchy. We just come together and we offer what we do as artists within, within the, I guess within the structure of what we're working on and we're working from traditional story. We're working on a piece called Consequence right now, and Consequence is based on uh, nappy stories. And nappy stories are plain stories, and they're creation stories. So nappy is a, is a, is a, is a being that uh, helped to create all that we have in creation, as well as the nitsitsapi. And the nitsitsapi are Real, it's basically a real, a real human being is what the, what the word means. Nitsitsapi, a real human being. And Nappi fashioned uh, the Nitsitsapi out of uh, the earth and, um, uh, you know, and, and the small, just all this, like, the earth that was there uh, and, and some water and, and started to roll these, these or there's two things that, that, that Nappi did, but rolled these earth balls and then blew into them, and then began to spread them out on the earth, roll them out on the earth, and wherever they stopped, they, they grew into some part of creation. So the, so the Nappy stories talk a little bit about that process. Nappy also created human beings, and, he, and Nappy started by creating the bones and tried to fashion some, some bones, and then he would dry them in the sun. And... Uh, uh, and then began to fashion them. And then used the fat and the, and the inner skin of the buffalo to actually fashion that, that human being. And again, blew into, the, blew into that human being and came to life. So this is the, this is the relationship to the, to the natural world that we carry with us right from our creation stories. And in the opening, in the opening acknowledgement, you know, the people who walked here. Well, the people that were here didn't just walk here. <laughs> they, we, we had a, a, a deep relationship with, with the land and the water. You know, it was a relationship of reciprocity, um, uh, of caretaking, of of living in uh, uh, in, com in complete commun communion with with the natural the natural world. 
not only in what, what we can see, and again, my elders, this is what my elders are telling me, is they're saying most of it is unseen. So we were able to facilitate our relationship through the unseen as well. So that's just an example. The nappy stories are just an example of what, we're, what, we're, what we are exploring from a storytelling, from a narrative, a cultural narrative perspective, because we, we are an oral people. And to me, that makes all the, to me, that makes all the difference as well, is that how do we reconstruct our, our oral legacy in a world where we're, you know, we're writing and we're, you know, we're you know, working on these instruments and that sort of thing, but, but the idea of, of speaking and, and orator uh, is something quite, quite, quite special, and, and that's part of what I'm exploring as well in terms of reclaiming. The UN has designated 2019 as the International Year of Indigenous Languages. I think about that a lot as well. And so if I was gonna come and greet you, if we were gonna see each other, my elders would say, Sego, what guego? Shkanagoge. Shkanagoge. <laughs> it means, it, it, what, it, what, it, what it means is that it's a greeting that says, uh, is the great peace with you? Are you with the great peace? That's the, that's the greeting as Haudenosaunee people. I would come to you and I would say, is the great peace with you? That's the great law of peace, you know? Uh, and I think about that often. Uh, and, and because I imagine being in a, in a way uh, that is so rooted in peace uh, and, and how we live one day, uh, to me that's very special. So um, I take that into account as, as I'm doing my, my work and my journey as well. So that brings us to uh, what we're working on now. Over the last few years, there's been a number of initiatives. Canadian Heritage has been very interested in helping to develop uh, more rural uh, Indigenous performers, Indigenous presenters, and places where we could, or places that could host Indigenous work around the province, particularly out of the urban centers. So Canadian Heritage began that project, which was really, really quite wonderful. I think it, I think it engaged seven or eight communities across Northern Ontario. And that's continuing, right? But that process is also ha having to re almost even reclaim the language that uh, folks who are interested in, in hosting or bringing you know, Aboriginal uh, work into their community, it's not necessarily presenting as it is maybe in Toronto. So it's a whole process of, of, uh, of learning a language, learning a way, um, and coming into this idea that we can share work and that we can host work and we can bring work in. Uh, so that's ongoing, so that's starting, okay? Uh, Capicoa has done some work with uh, um, pairing indigenous uh, performers with, uh, with theaters. For example, Santi Smith at Gahawi was paired with the Sanderson Center and they did some work together around presenting and, and bringing work to the stage in that, in that context. So there's some work going on. But we're right now, we're in a proscenium stage situation, right? This is how we are right now. This is not how we want to work necessarily as indigenous artists. Uh, this is not how I would choose to work. We want to work in the round, okay? That means we have a, the space has a central focus and everyone's on the same level. There, there isn't much of that for us. Um, we, had, uh, we had a residency through, through Wasaki Chuck a couple years ago and it was a situation where the residency really didn't serve us because the, sta the, the, the space didn't serve us. It was more Western oriented and the context in which we were working, we could just not break out of it. Um, so it really, in the end, it really didn't serve us. What I'm finding out, what I'm, what I'm discovering is that many artists want to work in, especially if they're working in relation to their traditional narrative or their cultural narrative, that they want to work inspired from the natural land as well or the natural environment as well. So if we continually try to bring people into the city, is that really serving or is that really the way to help nurture what they're trying to say through their artwork? So there's lots of questions. To me, there's lots of questions about how we want to go forward, but we want to go forward in a self-determined way. Right? And so what we're doing with the Arts Build project 
is we want to do an infant inventory of what's happening out there. And we just talked about North Bay and Anamatazic. They've been working for 10 years with their family and with their community. Um, and they've created uh, a, very, uh, a very grounded, very rooted in the culture uh, space uh, where I think that very much they can, they, can, they can truly start to explore and reclaim much of their, much of their, their cultural narrative uh, through art, through the arts practice. I mean, I love the, I love the ice follies, right? I mean, they're, they're working in relationship to the, to the lake. I mean, in a frozen state, <laughs> but, what's their, but they're still you know, working with the, with the lake in that, in that way. So it's, it's really, really quite, quite beautiful. And that is part, that is, to me, that has to be part of the reconciliation process because our cultural way is in relationship to the land. You can't have cultural wellness without that. Uh, and I think we have to relook at that and in particular how we're, you know, what kind of space and what kind of place uh, supports us in doing our artwork. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Arts Build Ontario? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Alex. Um, this conversation started, and I'll talk about Arts Build in a minute, but I want to talk about mm -hmm. how the project came to be. Um, so the project that we're talking about is uh, looking at communities across Ontario and the needs for Indigenous creative spaces. There is a need in each community uh, for Indigenous creative space, and it's different in each community as well. If we look at Toronto and the need for art space period here, uh, and then we look at the need for Indigenous art space here in relation to that, that's a different dynamic than we're going to get uh, in perhaps some northern communities. Um, mm -hmm in, for example, Dabajmajik in Manitoulin mm -hmm. Island, uh, that you know, might be a different relationship and a different situation as well. And so the purpose of this, um, you know, it all started uh, a year ago uh, over a coffee on Church Street and JP and I met. JP called me uh, because he was uh, <laughs> looking at a project uh, in Ottawa uh, at the Odawa Native Friendship Center. And it was about a proscenium theater. It was about a performance space um, and working with a group in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. And then, mm -hmm. then came around the conversation about mm -hmm. land-based artistic practice. Mm -hmm. So we had this coffee and then we realized we hatched a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> it was to better understand the needs for indigenous creative spaces because there are, it, there's an underrepresentation. There's, under, mm -hmm. there's not enough opportunity for indigenous artistic practice here period. Mm -hmm. And so we want to, what the project purpose is, is to incite action, to create space, to explore what spaces could be indigenous creative spaces need um, to inform the art. Uh, so what we have started to begun the process of seeking funding for, um, we're calling it the Indigenous Creative Spaces and Places Project. Um, it's three years long. It's one chapter in the long work that needs to be done. And it's quite urgent. You know, Arts Build Ontario, who we are, we're a nonprofit art service organization dedicated to supporting creative spaces across the province. So we have resources, we have tools, we have programs that support these projects. But there is a unique need when it comes to Indigenous creative space and the dialogue and the communities that that we are not serving actively right now as an organization. So it's a priority for Arts Build right now. Um, and so through this work, the project uh, is driven by an indigenous advisory circle. Mm -hmm. So to JP's point earlier, the circle process um, will very much drive many stages of this project. Um, so that circle um, is, the representatives from that circle are from 10 communities across Ontario. East, north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. um, and so that circle will be informing all the aspects of what we're doing. So the first year, we'll see us go to these 10 communities and have gatherings um, with individuals who identify as Indigenous um, in terms of the needs that they are looking for in their own communities around space. Mm -hmm. And each of those circle members will host one of those gatherings. And then after we complete that first year, um, we're looking at the second year where we're, we're taking all that information um, and we're making a needs and recommendations report. So this report will be collating all the, all the conversation, the minutes, uh, the surveys that we're getting, um, 
as well as some case studies as well in existing indigenous art spaces and putting that all together for a report for the sector. So we can collectively look at this and see what is missing, what is the potential for indigenous creative spaces, and it can also help to make a case for those who are wanting mm -hmm. to pursue those projects. Um, and then in that second year, we'll start developing some workshops and webinars. So the workshops in person and online complement one another, of course. But the workshops will go back to those same 10 communities and actually share what we've learned um, and hopefully give the tools that are needed that have been self-determined mm -hmm. to create indigenous mm -hmm. creative spaces in their communities. Um, there will also be some conversation around settler creative spaces as well. This is sort of a separate dialogue um, than the conversations that are happening in terms of uh, indigenous creative spaces. It's very much giving autonomy, and again, to that self-determined process mm -hmm. um, and ensuring the voices of uh, appropriately are around the table for each of those conversations and mm -hmm. not occupying space mm -hmm. where perhaps they should not. Mm -hmm. Do you have a point? Um, it's, it's just a minor point, but it's, um, it's like this, um, how do I say it? So er, er, earlier this evening before we started presenting, uh, we were talking a little bit about the composition of the amount of organizations that receive funding in Canada. And um, uh, I was throwing out this statistic that uh, the Canada Council for the Arts has uh, more than 1,400 uh, organizations receiving core funding, like operating grants. Mm -hmm. And um, the Creating, Knowing, and Sharing Department has 25 Indigenous mm -hmm. organizations receiving core funding. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that's the only Indigenous organizations receiving core funding. There are a few others that opted not to move into an Indigenous-specific department mm -hmm. for various political reasons, one of which uh, is a massive conversation that happened when that department was formed, which was whether or not uh, they should hold that space or leave the space open for others to come in. This is a survivalist strategy that the indigenous uh, arts organizations mm -hmm. have had for a long time about the stronger groups going after non-indigenous money because they know they can get it. And then therefore leaving the other pool of money available for people who are able, uh, not as readily able to compete in the larger streams. But at the same time, like let's say there's twice as many, like 50 out of 1,400. Mm -hmm. And then you think about like the composition of the country and whether that's enough to do the work of you know, the relationship with the First Peoples and everyone else. And this is where you start looking at how uh, there's a need for self-determined organizations to exist, but that doesn't let the mainstream organizations not carry their weight of the relationship. Mm -hmm. I know that's a really important point, mm -hmm. uh, Clayton. And um, you know, there's been a few conversations that Artsbolt's been having uh, in communities about indigenous creative spaces, and one that JP attended at the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center. Um, it was part of one of the mass culture gatherings that was happening last year, and it was around, if Waterloo Region were to get uh, an indigenous creative space, what would it look like? Like, well, there's been no space for this conversation in, in the community that Artsbolt, you know, we're based in Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, to have. And, you know, we had two gatherings. The first one was with artists, academics, and activists who identified as indigenous. And I was the only settler there. Um, and my role was to support that conversation by taking minutes and you know, answering questions when I was asked. Um, and then we had a second gathering where we would, um, the first gathering participants would share uh, their vision. Um, and at the second gathering we had uh, funders we had mm -hmm. uh, municipal representatives, we had allied arts organizations. And I would say that there was a point where there was a conflict in that conversation. And where was a pivotal moment for me, you know, as a settler that is working to be an active ally uh, when it comes to reconciliation is that there are allies or there are individuals that do think they're quote unquote woke. Um, and hmm. they're not <laughs> like it, it, you know, it was a very pivotal moment in the conversation mm -hmm. that completely at the moment derailed all of the progress that had been made in that, in that dialogue. And what was, and, and it was interesting because everybody else in the room who identified as indigenous was not surprised at all. Well, as we were, I mean, I, mm. we were just, that was horrible. And you guys were like, yeah, we get it all the time. Mm. Um, and so 
you know, f you know, as we approach this work and as you know, they're, we're building the bridges are being built. It, it's 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 bridge work, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the bridge can be a lonely place sometimes because um, there's two sides uh, to this. But at the same time, we're all together looking at one goal. And so what we learn in this project is you learn who is on board and you learn who is not. Mm -hmm. And the people who are on board are the ones that you want with you when you force or go through this work together. Um, and so all this to say is when you know, allies are taking on um, this work in term, the work that needs to be done, that they're accountable to do. This is not just a check off the box here. Mm -hmm. This is very much an active project that is creating action in communities. Um, and the allies that are doing that need to be informed and they need to be open to being wrong. They need to be open to learning and they need to be open to unlearning. So I would say that's the biggest process in part of this work. Um, and you know, when we have that conversation, the organizations that are engaged need to be prepared to have those conversations too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the first thing that you mentioned. So in, in, in Ottawa, there was a community hub being established uh, at the former Rideau High School. Um, and uh, so there were two sort of major players in there, the Odawa Friendship Center went in and then another organization that represented a basically culturally diverse social service organizations that went in into that space as well. Uh, there's a, a uh, I think it's like a five to 600 seat proscenium theater in that, in that uh, high school, beautiful theater. Um, and I got all excited. I was like, okay, well, maybe we can do something with that space. Maybe we can transform it a little bit. Maybe we can you know, really bring in a, a space where we can actually uh, uh, create work where we can, you know, really have that 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 big theatrical space that we could use to uh, to, to do our work. As I continue to investigate that, and and the relationship within the within the building was you know was unfolding, uh, that space was then determined as a space that needs to be a shared space uh, throughout the clientele that were that were uh, occupying the hub, and so that nothing really could be done with it, and it had to remain as it is, and. Uh, you know, so it, it, so it's it's those kinds of things, and I just realized, oh, that's not the space for us. So that's not this. It's not it's not unfolding into the space that I, uh, you know we think we need. Um, so that 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 was really fresh when I met Alex, and uh, the idea that um, and and with the inspiration of, of folks like Sid and Penny who have been creating their own space, uh, it's like okay, well, how can we start this conversation? It's, uh, it's been a long time. Um, yeah, we do have organizations on operating funding, uh, but in terms of the history of, of public funding in Canada, you know, the, uh, uh, it's been 50 years, and so much infrastructure, so much money towards infrastructure, and, and these cultural institutions, these Western cultural institutions uh, to, to, to be created and to formulate. Um, it's gonna take some time for us, obviously, but we need to be able to, I think, get our thinking together we need to shed some light on this so that we can create a strategy going forward and that hopefully is the work we're gonna be doing over the next few years um, with, the, uh, with the arts build. So it's an inventory, uh, it's a discussion around uh, what, what, what's really working, best practices. Um, the idea, the idea, uh, idea that the province, let's look at the province as a whole ecology here in Toronto being just part of that, that overall ecology. There's a lot of talk around networks. How do we move, how do we now move work around uh, how do we share uh, amongst uh, uh, and make that, that network that we can move out of the city into more rural, into reserves, and really find a way to start really connecting rather than living in, in the isolation that we're, that we're dealing with now. So, yeah. I, um, I, 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 love, um, I love bridge building um, for relationships and um, over time, I learned that uh, you have to be consistent in your behavior um, because I've also been a lot involved in a lot of um, opposition-driven, uh, we could call it um, uh, obstruction building, right? I, would, I don't want to say barricades, that's messed up. Um, but like the idea that um, if you get used to people seeing you as being obstructing then uh, people don't trust you when you try to build a bridge mm -hmm. and vice versa. Um, people that are used to obstructing uh, for good reasons 
when you're perceived as a bridge builder, you're not really welcomed into that obstruction behavior. So you have to kind of choose. But the point to this, my, this statement is that those are both extremely necessary things. Um, the challenging of something isn't uh, necessarily like an act of harm. Um, people should have relationships that are strong enough that if they're challenged, they still hold up. And if they don't, if it falls apart by it being challenged, then how strong was it in the first place? So there's this part of me that um, thinks a lot about how it's that same idea of how if someone is um, really telling some truth and it drives people towards someone who's more sympathetic and trying to build a network, it's funny how they might come to me to, tell, to, 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 to be like telling them, well, they're right. <laughs> but they'll have to come hear that from me <laughs> in order to, to see the truth in that statement. And, you know, it, it's this idea that we're all going towards this kind of mutually beneficial place, but uh, we all have to choose our path on how to get there. And that's what every institution has to look at when it starts talking about what is its role to the land that it exists upon. Um, who are the people that they're hiring and whether representation is something that they care about. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much that I could go into, but I, I don't want to take up too much more time. <laughs> I could literally talk all day about this. <laughs> what do you think? Should we... Maybe folks are sitting on some questions, discussion points. It would be nice to, to open it up a little bit. Yeah. Oh, they're going to circulate something. Oh, they're going to circulate something. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your words and your sharing. Um, this is very awkward talking into the microphone. I'm wondering if you might be able to share an example, if it exists, of a positive reciprocal process that you've had with a Western organization or institution? I, I have one immediately. I have one too. Yeah. Play, you, go, you can go first if you want. <laughs> okay. So uh, very positive uh, was my, my, just my recent work with the National Gallery of Canada. And on uh, November 7th, they opened up uh, Abidakwane, Abidakwane uh, a large indigenous exhibition of 72 indigenous artists from around the world. So I was able to uh, be involved in the proper process of welcoming the indigenous artists. They invited all 72, but I think uh, somewhere around 52, 54 came. And in their, in their coming to, this, to the Algonquin territory in Ottawa, it's so important to then activate the protocol between nations. So that was part of my role, is to support the, uh, the Algonquin folks in organizing themselves to come into the gallery and to hold an initial circle where they're doing the, the actual uh, traditional protocol of welcoming these other indigenous artists to the, to the territory. That then we connected to a larger uh, welcoming, public welcoming in the Great Hall. But as, uh, as important, we, we needed to do that traditional welcoming first, followed by a feast. So they feasted one another as well. From there, it transitioned into a, a processional uh, where they entered the Great Hall and, and, and did a more public welcoming. But the gallery was so, uh, so um, open to working with their space and working with the host nation to do it in a proper way. So it was really wonderful uh, how they were able to be open with the space, uh, to be uh, their, their, their team, their staff was very engaging, very open to listening. We had a number of, of meetings that, that talked about the whole process and sharing, sharing some of the cultural aspects of what does it mean to make this happen. Um, and then also we worked and expanded. What, what we're doing is we're expanding the relationship with the Algonquin folks. There's actually 11 Algonquin communities within the territory. And now, the first, the first, uh, the first real sort of um, 
uh, movement into that was through the, through the National Arts Center when the Indigenous Theater just opened. They went through a whole year process of engaging the host nation. And they did this process of actually uh, um, uh, reaching out to those 11 communities as, as introducing themselves or introducing it, right? And then inviting them to that event and that opening. And the National Gallery did the same. So it's really wonderful how they're opening to the, to the broad view of the territory, 11 communities. They want representatives from all those 11 communities to come in the B within that protocol process. So it was very positive. Yeah. Um, I'll give, uh, so that's, that's be beautiful. And I absolutely agree that, that, that uh, the National Gallery is doing great work. <coughs> I, I'm, I'm on their board of trustees. So I'm, I, have to, I have to say that. Um, but it's true. I'm really proud of the work they're doing. Um, I'll, I'll tell a, a, a very brief story that is a little bit like, how do I say this? I'll just tell it. And I won't name people because it's better to leave it that way. Um, so I was a, a curator invited to uh, a meeting in regards to a project. And it was going to be like one of those like big year-long projects. So it's like a relatively decent payday if you're going to do it. And I really didn't understand the context of the invitation, and a couple of colleagues were invited as well, and none of us had consult been consulted. We just came to this meeting together. And this was about four or five years ago at this point, so it was before I was the ED at the, at the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective. And um, I went to this meeting, and I was like, they, they said they want to do this road trip where we're going to go to all these reserves across Canada together, and we're all going to pile into like a car and do that. And I was like, really? That's uh, super weird. <laughs> um, and, uh, and honestly, like, I'm like, how many of these reserves have you been to before? And they're like, oh, none of them. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, we'll see how this goes. And then they said, well, we're really interested in indigenizing our institution. And I was like, what? That's awesome. And my colleagues who were there were like, slow down, Clayton. And I'm like, what do you mean? This sounds great. I'm loving this. And they're like, and they're, and they're like, yeah, what's wrong? And they're like, what do you mean by indigenization? And they said, well, you know, uh, following like indigenous spirituality at our office and like following the medicine wheel teachings. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, I thought you were going to fire everyone and hire all native people. <laughs> and, uh, and that was what we were going to go on a road trip to do. Um, I thought I was going to be getting in a car to give jobs to people. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to go and help them. And I was like, oh, okay, well, no, we're not going to do that. And they're like, well, why not? I'm like, well, I'm not going to get in the car and go meet 200 people with you that I will be accountable to for the rest of my life. Because that's how relationships work for me. I can't go and present one day and present and pretend that I'm making some kind of difference or that I've changed people's lives. Like, I'm not that person. And, you know, then we went further in the conversation and we uh, asked about what the relationship with the local community was, which they had none. There was zero understanding of the community that they were living in that I was not part of. And, you know, I was saying, well, why don't you start there before you start these grandiose change the world's plans? Like, why don't you have a relationship with the people you actually live with and find out what they feel about these kind of plans before you recruit people from across the country and basically talked my way out of getting a big payday, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, I don't regret at all. But the positive aspect to that is that they took those recommendations very seriously and they went and they did that work and they've built stronger relationships with the community they serve. And then if that group was here right now, they'd be the ones probably laughing because they would never propose that project. They know what that project would do because they've built better relationships themselves. But you know, enthusiasm and like best intentions can be like the absolute worst recipe to like end, like uh, have a terrible relationship for them. Like just horrible things can go wrong. And um, yeah, so I mean, that was like my positive outcome was like saying no to them and having them be okay with someone saying no. So they didn't go and recruit three other more like-minded native people the next day, <laughs> which they could have probably did, you know? Instead they listened and they learned and that was great. Thank you. Cool. I see a hand up there. Just a second, yeah. So. 
Oh, thank you. I'm wondering about spaces that exist like other than the National Gallery, like maybe the AGO or other institutions um, that uh, have existed a long time, clearly not indigenized. Uh, is it better to find alternate spaces or to go in and actually try to indigenize something that was never really serving the community, in your opinion? Um. I think that like, uh, I always, okay, so I mean, I, I'm the one that brought the term indigenize up and I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and I, I often don't use that term at all because I find it, you know, very, uh, it can be very confrontational to some people and therefore there's easier ways to talk about like indigenous inclusion. Um, I think the AGO has made a lot of steps forward the best they can. Uh, I think Wanda Nanabush is doing uh, a job, uh, like a, uh, like a very challenging job to hold space with an institution that hasn't had the structure to have that space get held. Uh, if I was asked, are they, are they doing a good job? I'm like, I think Wanda's is doing a great job and I think the AGO has a long way to go still. Um, you know, like the representation level of indigenous staff for an organization that outwardly has a very large amount of, in, of indigenous programming. Uh, the representation level is still relatively low, even though there are more than there were, you know, five to 10 years ago. Um, but I think those are the, the challenges of growing, growing pains and, and kind of updating self ongoing. Um, but I mean, like the AGO is also like a very public entity. There are many organizations that, uh, you know, colleges and universities that have indigenous programs being taught by non-indigenous people. Uh, it sends a very bizarre message out. And um, like within indigenous communities, or sorry, within in the indigenous arts community, the working professionals, there's like a constant narrative of who should be holding space. And you know, like the, the volume of white passing indigenous people that are holding jobs. And this, narrative, I mean, this responsibility that puts on people like myself is to be constantly making effort to open doors for those not present and constantly seeking out those that are trying to be included and finding ways of getting them into these places. I mean, at the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, that was mm. the actual job, was to find how to make those jobs exist. I think the new generation uh, response is now now that some of the jobs exist, how do we make them worth you know, having? And how do we make sure that many more people than the few that were, um, we'll say qualified with air quotes, the few that are qualified to take them uh, are not the only people that ever benefit from that. So in other words, like how is uh, outreach taking place on reserve to make it that uh, the arts are a viable career choice for youth mm -hmm. at all? Um, I would say that work is still not being done effectively. I guess I might not be clear about my question because I'm thinking about the space itself serving. So could the AGO ever, even with Wanda Nanabush and anyone else who's doing an amazing job, could it ever serve the purposes of the communities? Oh, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, I would look at it in terms, for me, I think of the National Arts Center Right, it's the same. Right? They have a they have an indigenous theater, right? So it will serve us to us to a certain degree, you know, a certain probably a certain part of our of our artists would you know would 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 be able to flourish in that. But that's that's only part of our whole ecology, and I think we have to continue to uh, uh, be cognizant that we have to um, continue to reclaim the full ecology um, and and self determine a way that. Um, is valuable to us, you know. Uh, so for me, um, I think there's. I mean, I think I think to some degree, yes, those institutions can can support, but not fully. Um, and yeah, there's there's like a, a part to that that's like, um, like would will museums be that? Mm -hmm. And there are um, many uh, indigenous people that uh, see the value in museum culture and and you know even the westernized version of museum culture, which is the original version. But um, there are many efforts being done in museum uh, spaces to make the spaces be alive, 
make them be activated, um, to have it that the culture is not locked in a box and, and preserved as much as it's um, a place to be activated and, dis and you know more learned about or displayed or, or engaged with as opposed to um, the history that museums have of restricting access to uh, culture, even from the people that uh, the culture originated from. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if uh, communities in the long run will think that museums are enough or if uh, they play a role and then there is the need for something completely different that I don't know what it is because it maybe doesn't exist yet. But um, I know that there's a lot of effort being put in to try to figure that the answer out to that question. So I mean, I agree with JP being like, yes in one way and absolutely not in another. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I also think, if I may, um, that you know our traditional colonial arts institutions have their own definition of what indigenous equity is in their space. Um, so that is an assumption, a lot can get lost in assumptions. Um, so, and one can fall in love with their own story, right? Like, so I think that that can be a little bit blindsiding. Um, so I think, again, it goes back to the leadership of that organization, the priorities of that organization, um, and then bringing in the people uh, to have voices at the table. So it's not being dictated, it's, it is very much, uh, there's autonomy and representation as a part of that process. Mm -hmm. All right, who's got a fun question? Yes, I'd like to dance, you're, you're right. Hi, um, where would you distinguish, or where would you draw the line between cultural appreci appreciation versus cultural appropriation? Oh my God. <laughs> Are you like Google stalking me? Uh, oh, so uh, you want me to start with that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, that's such a great question. And I think there's so many people trying to figure that out right now. And uh, I think about the steps that are being taken in regards to indigenous uh, intellectual property and you know, uh, legally ref deferred, referred to as uh, intangible property, like the idea of who owns community knowledge and who can benefit from it and own it and defend it in court. And um, these are translations that uh, have to be made because these are the court systems that govern the lives that we all live within. It uh, doesn't mean that that's necessarily the community's path or the way that they look at it, but um, uh, you know, obviously that changes from community to community. The hard part is that there's no real um, one answer. There's each community's answer to that question. Um, each community has a very different way of uh, holding ownership over their culture, and therefore they have the right to say whether something is um, break crossing a line or not, and that becomes case by case by case. It's very complicated. Um, there's also this idea that um, when someone says, you know, know that that means that it's like a obstruction or or that it's like a like a opposition. Um, no, you shouldn't do this, or no, please don't take that, um, or that if someone's story isn't going to be told, that the rest of the world loses something, but at the same time, like, at some point, you know, maybe some things aren't for everyone, and then, you know, the world can be okay with that. Um, you know, that it doesn't have to be that everything is for everyone. Um, but I think that that's a, a big shift in our uh, society's way of looking at things in general, and that um, uh, it's, it's growing pains watching it all happen. Um, the hardest part is like this, this uh, when it comes to the cultural appropriation, like the idea of censorship and freedom of speech as being like these oppositions or like, uh, like harsh oppositions. And um, there's a part where I've been, had to argue a lot with people about how you're not like censoring, like it's, it's, it becomes about removing someone else's ability 
to have freedom of speech by replacing their voice in that space. And it's not that I don't think that someone shouldn't have uh, freedom of speech. It's more that you have to think about whether the people that you're taking something from even have the capacity to defend themselves. Um, and that's like the real like intense, you know, like a franchise clothing line kind of argument. Uh, it's not really this idea of like someone saying, well, I have this whimsical way of my painting and because I grew up beside this community, I've, I'm kind of including it in there. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And people are like, oh, isn't that cultural appropriation? And I'm like, no, they're not like copying their work and pretending they are them. They're stating very clearly the relationship they have to that. Um, but there you have it, right? Like this honesty of relationships, the connection to it, the reasons why. I've been fascinated by watching people mimic indigeneity, produce it as if it is, and then quickly when it's revealed it's not, like take everything down and run away. <laughs> um, I would love to see somebody do it uh, to try to actually provoke arguments. I just don't think that uh, cultural identity and uh, is like the kind of battleground that provocateurs really want to take. There's bigger issues in the world other than race relationships to tackle. And anyone tackling uh, race relationships in a provocateur manner is gonna get called a racist. Like that's how fast that'll happen. So where's the line? Um, I guess it's wherever the, co the community you're engaging is comfortable with that line being there. And if you cross it, um, are you comfortable having them tell you that? <laughs> and that's, as an artist, what everyone has to determine is like, where are their boundaries? Mm -hmm. That's a long answer. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I keep hearing the, the, the phrase, nothing about us without us. Is, you know, I, I hear that, so. Uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, but I, I guess I'm in relation, you know, I, I, I guess I'm operating in terms of like storytelling, for example, or stories, you know, which, uh, which are often, you know, uh, they're collectively owned, you know, the community owns it, right? Just not one person. So yeah. it, it's really a different, really a different way, you know, and uh, it is about relationships. So for example, when I left the Canada Council in 2011, uh, it, it took me about 18 months because I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work here in Ottawa. I actually have to have a relationship with the Algonquin folks. And so I went to work to, to make that relationship. And I already have you know, some connection um, you know, through past work, but it still it took me that long right, to, to actually make that proper connection. So. I, um, what you said just it makes me think of a very brief story that I use as an argument to help people recontextualize their relationships in, re in regards to appropriation specifically. And it was like, uh, I, I often say, so there's this, this prominent uh, white, uh, you know, like mystery author, um, and, and he's going to go up to James Bay and do a murder mystery about uh, James Bay Cree and live up there and write about things. And everyone's like, so there you go, that's textbook appropriation. Like you're infiltrating a community doing this. And I'm like, yes, and I've led you into a trap where the community up in that region, uh, one of the communities is a massive fan of this author and they have actually solicited him to come and work there and do this. And it's the community's bringing that person in. And everyone's like, well, but isn't that kind of wrong? And I'm like, we don't have the authority to override what a community wants. Mm -hmm. They can hire anyone they want and do what they want to do. Individuals could be upset about it. And in the end, it, you know, you could say that this somehow falls on bad taste among their peers, but that's, where the negotiation takes place. That's where we're still working it out. It wasn't, uh, there's a lot of consent that is happening there and there's a lot of understanding between the people. And one group doesn't get to say what another group doesn't get to do. I guess I'm just curious also to hear about um, other organizations that are inspiring or artists that are inspiring you guys. I'm sure you've had so many um, wonderful experiences. It'd be great to hear about who are some of the characters that are making good waves. And we've heard a couple, but yeah. Uh. 
Toronto-based. Let me start by saying I think Native Earth's doing a great job. I'm currently doing directing for uh, climate change theater action plays for them uh, that are part of the Wasega Czech Festival. Um, and I'm loving that experience, working with all the indigenous actors there. Uh, who are all like extremely talented and way too professional and I feel radically spoiled being able to work with them. Um, I think about how Imaginative has uh, become an Oscar qualifying festival and how like people, you know, <laughs> and how my, my children came and my, my work had, was in uh, Imaginative a few years ago. And my kids came and said, oh, that's really great for you. And I was like, what? And they're like, well, that means that you could win an Oscar now. And I was like, okay, obviously the Oscars don't work like that, which is adorable. I'm like, yeah, they'll call the person from three years ago and take the award back from them <laughs> to give it to me. <laughs> but uh, but that's, that, was the, that was the first thing they thought about was how much it elevated all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're right, it does. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, I'll let you maybe talk a bit. But th those two stand out very quickly for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and I've I've had such a pleasure of working with the the National Arts Center with the opening of their Indigenous theater and how they did it properly as well in terms of um, um, making sure that they really engage the, the 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 totality of the Algonquin people in a proper way. So that and and as well as the National Gallery. I think what, what, what I'm stuck with here, especially, you know, I guess in the Toronto area is, is the loss of the Indigenous Culture Fund at, uh, at the Ontario Arts Council, which, which um, I know there was a lot of work that went into that, you know, a lot of wonderful, wonderful work, and then just to take it away, you know, even before it began to really make a difference, uh, I think is very heartbreaking, you know, for, for me particularly, because it, it opened that it opened that that way of working that was much more culturally based, and 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 we're holistic, right? We're, we're, that that's really the, the the traditional way of of our of our worldview is that we're holistic and we make those connections and we want to work with, you know, we want to work with uh, with different aspects of our community and, and art and uh, and people coming together. So yeah, yeah. Um, just to say that further, like I, I think that that's uh, I can't I can't get it out of my head how terrible that it was. Um, that fund uh, was open to um, in community cultural actions that were totally a stretch to try to bring those actions into the existing uh, arts uh, program grants. And uh, the reason why I say that is that all of the in indigenous project grants that are at the Ontario Arts Council are based on the non-Indigenous project grants. So it's not, it's not to cr criticize that at all. I think they're wonderful. But they do you know, prioritize like professional arts practices as the behavior and the way that that works. And then to say land-based teachings or language work or working with elders in a certain capacity, like to try to write that and recontextualize that act into a contemporary arts practice with professionals is such a challenge that I wouldn't hand that to any grant writer to do. So the loss of that program is, is a massive setback. Mm -hmm. And on a personal level, I'd like to say, hey, Dougie, huh? You, me, flagpole, come on. You know, threaten to beat up the prime pre premier, and that's like a mood killer, huh? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, one thing that was touched on were sort of um, some of the more specific or unique needs around indigenous creative spaces. You mentioned the importance of um, proximity to nature. I was wondering if you could um, give s s further examples or other things that you think. Um, or should be factored? Uh, a real fast one for me is, um, you mentioned the Center for Indigenous Theatre. Um, because it's a uh, Toronto-based organization, uh, they, in previous years, have had a relationship where they do, uh, you know, like a week or a couple weeks up with Amatogsi at, at this location mm -hmm. uh, to try to make it that there is that uh, 
disconnect of the urban automatically. Um, it's, a, it's, it's small, but it's meaningful in that way of trying to have time on the land as opposed to only, you know, in the, the concrete world that exists here. It's not a negative aspect uh, talking about cities, but it's like that, that juxtaposition is, is helpful to talk about certain teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, again, I think it's it's really about um, enabling communities to determine what they need, and it, and there's such a diversity within the province and then across the country, right? So uh, I think getting getting to the point where we're really able to listen and identify those types of needs and the diversity of those needs is really important, for sure. Um, you know, I, I I look at, for example, I look at the the Indigenous Theater at the National Art Center. And because we have not really uh, invested in our indigenous training programs, I mean, we have CIT, which is, but they have a handful of students a year, right? You know, wh where, is this, where is this indigenous, you know, artwork to, to fill those stages? Where is it going to come from? So, in, and for, for me, it's almost like they're putting the, the, the cart before the horse in a sense. But, so now it's really important. And again, that's another motivating factor for me, you know, in, in the work that we're doing with ABO is like, well, you know, how are we going to produce and how are we, how are we nurturing and how are we, you know, developing these, these, these younger generations of indigenous artists and the ones we have right now to be able to create work that will fill those stages. I think those are some of the cr critical cr questions we need to ask right now because the province, the, the, the nation has not invested in indigenous arts training yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. at all. So where's it gonna, where's it gonna come from, you know? That's like, just um, interesting. Even on a like arts training specific, mm -hmm. uh, even on a federal level, the um, uh, Canadian uh, Heritage's uh, Arts Training Fund has, uh, has really not, um, like there's a few indigenous organizations that are able to draw upon it. I, I, I want to say three. Um, and it's because of these ideas of uh, institutions of excellence and therefore, you know, uh, that there could be a place that would do indigenous dance as if that place could actually achieve a full spectrum mm -hmm. of indigeneity at all. Like it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's a very hard transition uh, from one way of living to uh, adapting into a place that, you know, holds a, a different standard of, of excellence in place. And um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that level too. Uh, without, you know, getting into uh, the, uh, the art, even just the arts budget in Ontario being stagnant for 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, you know, because you know, the population hasn't increased and minimum wage didn't go up. Oh wait, it did, yeah. you know, anyway, I'm so bitter. <laughs> <laughs> So it was like therapy a little bit. This is like I therapy. know. I've got <laughs> this you. light in my Thank face. You. I can't yeah. see the audience at all. So. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think on that note, um, I will uh, extend an enormous thanks uh, to Clayton Windat and to J.P. Longwood and uh, to Alex Glass uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you uh, to our audience uh, for being here, for participating, for asking some really um, insightful questions. Um, uh, the survey, uh, <laughs> the survey on the side. Uh, if you identify in any way as an artist, a cultural producer, uh, please uh, do stop by, uh, see Peter for either uh, the, the QR code or uh, a paper copy of the survey. We really, really appreciate your insights.